Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matthew Hall, and I am the Director of Marketing Admissions at the Australian International School. It's wonderful to have another guest on our Into the Classroom webinar series where we showcase the extremely talented teachers that we have across our three sub-schools. Joining me this evening is Jacinta Matheson, our Head of Year One. She has joined us from Melbourne and Australia several years ago, and it's going to be an absolute delight tonight hearing about her experiences of what Year One is up to and what they're doing inside their classroom. Welcome along, Jacinta. Thank you for that, Matt. It's nice to be here. Absolutely. Could you give the audience some background to your journey prior to coming to AIS and then just um, what your role is in, in AIS at the moment? Sure. So um, my husband and my son and I um, are originally from uh, Melbourne in Victoria. So we lived on the peninsula down at the beach, which we miss a little bit now. But um, I have worked in a variety of uh, PYP schools down there um, in a variety of roles. So I've taught, I think, every year level and um, a lot of different disciplines as well. So prep one, two, three, four, five, six. I've taught art. I've taught music. Um, so I love the PYP philosophy and I don't think that I would teach in any other way. Um, so we arrived uh, in Singapore four years ago now. Um, my son was very small at the time, but he's now in prep. Um, and yeah, so now I have taught year one in all of that time at AIS and I'm now currently the head of year curriculum. So my role there is to work with the teachers within year one around the curriculum planning and delivery. Wonderful. I'd, when we were, um, and you've just had young Bridie. Bridie is your youngest. How old's Bridie? I have. So she's six months in a couple of days. So yes, Singapore's given us lots to be grateful for. It's wonderful. I I saw about three years ago young William with your husband at school, and he's uh, so that I can imagine now. Uh, actually, when you said prep the other day, it gave me quite a surprise. I was like, gosh, I, I guess he must be, but. Uh, we have de developed a series of lovely slides here for the audience and that we can talk through. And the very first one I'd like to bring up is this amazing collection here. Um, there is a lot of beautiful images on here, but if, if you could start talking us through why you've chosen them, what the selection is, and it, it nicely encapsulates year one, I think. Absolutely. So it was tough to choose only a few pictures because yeah. we do in year one and I think that's what I wanted to capture on these uh, on this slide with these pictures so it is busy we are doing a lot of different activities and learning across a range of different subjects so um, you can see here we've got our specialist subjects so Mandarin and music and PE um, there is the video there um, which would show off our art room as well which I think people can see um, later on when they get sent the slides but mm. there's also you know a picture of us working together um, learning some maths there and we've got some science and some unit of inquiry some reading so look I just wanted to show that we get through a lot in year one it's yeah. fun it's relevant and I just put those words on there because you know, I wanted uh, the people who are watching tonight just to know that even though we're talking about six and seven year olds, we are exploring those ideas of being authors and readers and scientists and mathematicians. And we speak to them about the fact that that's what they are. I, I really enjoy that the way that you do that because it, it straight away makes them realize what learning's about. It doesn't make it abstract. Like you are an author, it's got a purpose. Writing is for a purpose. And I think that you. You discussed that beautifully. Just for our audience sake, um, tonight's um, episode is interactive. So if you've got questions as we go along, please feel free to type them into the chat bar. There is a chat bar here. And at the end, Jacinda and I will pause and we'll have about 15 minutes of question and answer. So it's a great way you can type as we go along, which is terrific. And Jacinda just pointed out too that we will send out this slide deck out to you and one of the images on here will play a lovely little video. What would we see on that video, Jacinda? I think you told me about it the other day, but what would the audience see on that video? 
It's actually really beautiful. Our, some of our year one students um, created it um, and they talk you through a little bit of the life of the year one. So you'll see some of our amazing learning spaces. You'll see um, the, some of the children's routines and what they do and they talk about their learning and what it's like to be a new one. Terrific. You were just saying before that they, they have the daily Mandarin, is that right? How often is that taught? What is that program like? Yes, so um, each of our classes have Mandarin for one period a day, so one 40-minute um, period a day. And wow. that's fantastic. It's, you know, completely in Mandarin. And, you know, I sit in sometimes and I just think, wow, like the children are learning so much and their ability to communicate in Mandarin already at this young age is quite impressive. Absolutely. I think we started Mandarin um, in all of the elementary classes about a bit before your time, but we had our first students coming through from who had had it all the way through um, year one, all the way to year five, and they just went into secondary. And it's exceptionally high um, level that they have when they go into year six. So that's absolutely terrific. Just what other specialist teachers do our year ones have? You just said Mandarin. Is there other areas that they have a specialist for? They do. So our students go to our wonderful new art studios for a double period a week with the wow. um, art teacher. They have PE twice a week where they are out and about in all of our various um, spaces that they're able to use, so the gym and the MPH and outside. Um, and they also have a double period of music every week. Um, which is fantastic in our wonderful music rooms. And then on top of that, we also have a gross motor pe um, period, which the teach classroom teachers take them for and the students rotate through a variety of different activities. You can see us in our coloured shirts in the picture there. That's um, on a gross motor day. All oh, right. And, and those shirts are to do with their houses, aren't they? They've got the, they'll have a colour per house. I'm right with that, aren't I? That's correct. And part of what we do is we actually teach the children to make reflective choices about what it is, where it is that they work best. So within a reader's workshop, we talk to them about, you know, you can see in that picture there, I'm sitting on the floor reading with a child. There are some children sitting on some comfy seats. There are some children working at a um, round table with another teacher. So within our reader's workshop, we um, have the opportunity for children to be choosing some of the books that they are wanting to read within um, their, their level. And we're providing them opportunities to read independently, to work with a teacher, to we work one on one with children and set them some reading goals. And during um, the reading workshop that we run, the students are having um, the opportunity to be talking about their reading, to be discussing books, similar to what you and I might do in a book club, yeah. for example. Um, and so it's just getting the children to start, you know, moving just from that idea that when I read, I'm just reading the words on a page to actually I'm understanding what it is that I'm reading and I'm able to talk about that. I, I love the way you frame that up, and it's um, we've, we've done several webinars, obviously, about into the classroom, and what I love hearing is some really common themes talking through different people, and you just, you mentioned Readers and Writers Workshop, but if, let's just talk about, let's just go for Writers Workshop. What is a Writers Workshop? So I've heard this all the way up in year six, I've heard it in year uh, in prep, and now you in year one, but can you just talk this audience through what that means? Sure. So the um, picture that is up in the top left-hand corner, um, I'll talk to that one and that will help us yeah. kind of explain what Writer's Workshop is. So within the Writer's Workshop, what it is is that we're looking at a variety of genres all through the process of writing. So we're teaching the children that just like J.K. Rowling or just like Mo Willems or any of their favourite authors, they are authors too who are going to go through the entire process of writing. And so we we study authors um, and we, we learn moves from them about um, how to write a story and how to write a persuasive piece and how to write an information uh, report. But all of that is done and we keep coming back to following that whole process. 
So the students are able to have independent practice, they're able to work through that and so they're planning their pieces, they're making sure they're drafting, they are revising and editing and publishing their writing. So they're getting, you know, mini lessons where we teach them, you know, key uh, parts of the process of writing like spelling and the structure of writing and voice and then they're having that opportunity to practice that in a really relevant way. And so you can see on the board, we actually provide the students an opportunity to track themselves throughout that process. Um, and they're able to refer to that board and we put up things that are going to help them remember, you know, the learning that we've done in the lessons that um, have led up to the current one that they are doing and they're able to kind of work through that process really quite independently. And it's quite amazing. You can see, um, I also put some writing up there on, on the screen for everyone to see. Um, and what you see, you see six and seven year olds who not only write a full piece of writing, they are editing it and they're putting, you know, they're going back and they're making changes to their writing. Is just a skill in itself and quite remarkable, I think, for this age group. I think that, that's absolutely terrific you say that and, and just for the parents and when we were having our pre-discussions we were talking about it on the board at the left where you can see that it's a grey board, it is a process going through so this is up, up there for the children to go back and reference but something really cool you said to me was you've got QR codes so you've got little QR codes at different places and the children, I think I'm right in saying this, each of the children have their own iPad so they can take their own iPad and go up there and scan the QR code. Can you take over from there? You'll be more of an expert. I'm not sure why I'm telling the story. <laughs> you tell us about sure, it. not a problem. Yeah. So what it is that we do is we will teach a lesson and after that lesson we'll then provide what we call anchor charts or displays right. for the children to be able to use that helps them remember what it is we've taught. So this is not new learning for them. This is not replacing the teacher. This is just helping provide supports for them to be independent. And so what you can see with the QR code there is actually beside our planning. And so for this unit, we talked to them about all the different um, ways that we could plan and different ideas and different topics that they could write about. So this one in particular we're looking at at the moment is persuasive. And so when the children get to that planning stage, if they say, you know, if they go to sit down and write and they think to themselves, oh, I don't know what it is I want to write today, they can get their iPad, go up, scan a QR code and it takes them to a range of images that we used previously with them to teach them about the different topics and it just gives them that idea of, oh, that's right, I could write about this or I could write about that, I could use this planner to plan my writing today and that just provides them that opportunity to be a little bit more independent. I think that is such a terrific use of technology, right? Like we, we, we can, you can hear that lesson normally and how we would have in the past, but it would have been lost as in can't refer back to it. And it's the being able to refer back that's so good. It means they don't have to, of course, they're not going to capture everything at once. So that is such an amazing resource to go back to. And then it's meant, you know, for later and other students to go to. I, I just think that's such a terrific I I, I didn't say we'd wait to the end um, for questions, but David's got a, quite a good question, actually. Um, so I will pop it in now because it won't, it won't hurt. Um, he's asking, why, why do the children write on the floor instead of tables? Is, can you just, because this is lovely, Those, the images are the children spread different places. Yeah, so the children, um, when it comes to actually writing, they're mm. usually writing at tables. Because right. we know that, you know, having better posture and things like that is better for them. What you can see in here is the children are writing on whiteboards as a part of a spelling lesson. Right. So um, that's just all when we're working in a small group. The children who are reading with the teacher in the bottom left are just writing on a post-it note. So it's just a quick note that they're writing to themselves as they're reading their book to remind themselves so that when they get to the discussion part of their reading group, they're able to share but when it comes to actually, you know, sitting down and writing a, you know, their piece of writing, they're normally at their at their tables. Yeah, I love that. It's just it, it it's a coincidental selection of writing uh, pictures that might give that impression, and that it is lovely. They're just lovely visuals because they are really in depth teaching and learning that you've got showing there. So they're nice little groups that you're working with, which is such good practice. So I'm gonna. 
go on to this next slide that we've got here and it's I, in my past life, I was a maths teacher, so I always get quite <laughs> excited about the maths. Um, <laughs> and these are wonderful learning images that you've got here. But again, there's a range here. Can I just start with the one that I got drawn to, and I'm sure the audience probably does as well. You've got zero to five there. You've got the different smiley faces um, at different points. Can you talk us through this? Sure. So this forms a part of, you know, the setup of the maths lesson um, within our classes, as well as the end point of reflection. So what it's showing, and I know it's a bit hard to see in that size, is that we um, explain to the children at the start what it is that we are learning about for the day. And so they form what we call success criteria. So um, in this slide, it says I can identify if a problem is addition or subtraction. It says I can choose a strategy to solve my problem. And so what we do is we introduce to the children what it is we're going to be doing as a part of the lesson. And we talk to them about the fact that if you're successful today, this is what you can do. It means that they are aware of what it is that they are learning. It helps them to understand the purpose of what they're learning. And the children often refer back to that throughout a lesson because sometimes it might, you know, they'll think to themselves, okay, well, what is it I'm doing? Oh, that's right. You know, I, I'm working on choosing a, a, an appropriate strategy. But I think the power then is what we do at the end, which is where that bottom part comes into it. So often at the end of a maths lesson, we'll do a reflection with the students about how they're feeling about the maths that they have done today. Not just maths, we do do it across the other subjects, but this one um, we'll talk about maths. And so the students are able, sometimes we just ask them to give us a number and so, you know, if it's a zero or a one, it might be, oh, today I found it really difficult. I'm a little bit confused about what we were doing. And that's just a si signal to us to say, I need a bit of help. And, you know, we talk to the kids about that is completely fine. And that's actually fantastic information for us and feedback for us so that we can go, okay, I'm going to work with you tomorrow. You're going to be in the group that works with the teacher and we're going to get you some help so that you can move up. But then we also have children who might say, oh, today I was a three. And they're able to use that language and say, I was a three and I was feeling really comfortable in my maths lesson today because I was able to tell if a problem was addition or subtraction because, and then we'll ask why, and they'll be able to reflect on that and communicate to us. I knew it was addition because it had the word more in it, for example. And so what it is that we're doing is just, not only you know teaching them the skills that they need for maths but those reflection and metacognitive skills to help them you know be able to think about their learning to communicate about their learning and you know that helps them move forward and it also gives us that feedback about okay you know these are the kids who tomorrow we need to give them a little bit of help or maybe tomorrow these are the kids who we need to extend them and give them you know that extra challenge I, I love the way that you've summed that up. And just for the for the parents listening, it's the really huge move that teaching and learning went through to make learning visible to children. So like Jacinda then, we talk about the success criteria so that children know how and when they will be successful in their learning. You beautifully just did something really great at the end of the lesson. You rechecked what learning the children had made before moving on. And that is... Um, from an outside person and someone that really loves maths teaching, so that's awesome to hear that you guys are, are doing that at that age. And it just shows that each lesson you're doing assessment. You're not waiting to the end of a unit to see where children at. You're doing it daily and regrouping and reassessing. So that's that's wonderful. I I love the three images of the children here because they're all doing different things. And again, you're doing something which is brilliant and that's using real materials with the learning. Can you talk us through the number line first? You can see there's a group of children looking around a number line. Can you tell us what learning is going on there? Sure. So, look, I think, you know, hands-on, using hands-on materials is so important, not only yeah. at this age, but also all throughout their elementary schooling. So, you know, the importance of that is just that they are able to understand concepts because they 
have, you know, the picture in their mind of what some of these things mean before they later on, you know, try and apply it um, in a more mental capacity. So with uh, the number line there, you know, it hands on, we're outside, we are, you know, the kids had different um, numbers on post-it notes and so we were creating a number line. And so, you know, we were talking about, all right, if we counted by ones, let's put the numbers in order, you know, where would they go, how would we space them out and then you know okay well what happens if we take away every second number all of a sudden we're counting by twos how do we count by fives by doing this so it just you know gives students the opportunity to create some of that learning for themselves to be making those connections you know rather than just filling in numbers on a worksheet this is something they're going to remember as well because it's fun it's engaging and, you know, they're asking questions and they are, you know, making hypotheses and st- things like that at the same time. Oh, and, and again, wonderful, wonderful to hear that. It's that first part of all maths. And even when you work up into secondary like I did, you should be starting with the hard materials because, like you say, numbers are very abstract and a lot of the ideas are abstract. And the, a good example me and you talked about is, Say if we had the number 659, now that's just 659 if we did it on on a worksheet. But like you said, there's six hundreds, five tens, and then four ones. And then by working on number lines, they get an idea how big those numbers are or how small that actually looks. Um, you've, you've got this wonderful image there of the the little blocks that the children have got at the top there and the little boys wearing a mask. Actually, I've noticed all the children are wearing masks. Are all the children wearing masks? Can you just tell the audience in case they're not from our school? We are. So at the moment, as part of our um, safe management measures, we are all wearing masks. And, you know, it took a little bit of getting used to at the start, but the children now just take it into in their stride, you know, and it doesn't seem to um, stop them at all. You know, they're yeah. getting very good at, you know, the nonverbal communication and being able to read facial expressions using the rest of the face and things like that. So it is just one of the ways that we are, you know, trying to stay safe and healthy at the moment, but it doesn't seem to be hindering our learning at all, which is great. I love it. Um, Liz is just asking a question. She's just saying, for students who are perhaps weaker in numeracy, would they get receive extra help one-to-one or how does that work in a class? Sure. So within a classroom, we are constantly catering for the needs of the students. So we will have children who, you know, they do, they need the extra bit of help. They need to hear things over and over again. They need lots and lots of practice with those materials until they get it. And so we provide support for that in the classroom. So they'll be working with um, the classroom teacher. We also have our teaching assistants who will be working with those students. But if we do identify that we've got some children who that's still not enough support for, we are able to um, provide support through our learning enrichment program. And we've got um, teachers and teaching assistants within that program who provide extra support across all areas of the curriculum so reading writing and maths and they work in small groups and they're doing a lot of what we're doing in the classroom but just giving them that extra little bit of practice so that then they're feeling confident and they're able to you know join back in and be able to do what it is that we're working on together in the classroom as well i I, fantastic i like the way that you, you you sum that up the last image i want to go to and it's just one that i love again coming from the mass background there's the nine squares there and there's little diagrams on them but not sure if the audience can see because they're a little bit small there's each of them's got a maths problem on them a number sentence can you just talk the audience through that what is what are these what are these about Absolutely. And this is, you know, we're looking at this in particular at the moment in year one, and I'm quite excited about it because it's been a huge area of growth within our students. So addition and subtraction is obviously, um, you know, an area that we teach in year one, and we're looking at solving addition and subtraction problems in different ways. And so 
what it is that we're looking at is what do what is the number sentence and is there one strategy over another that is better for us to use and so what we do is we explore all of the different strategies with the children and we give them an opportunity to practice each strategy to have a think about which one works in which such situation which one works for me because sometimes you know one will work better for me than others and what you can see there is another example of this would be up in the classroom so that when the children are working on you know doing this and they think to themselves oh hang on a minute how did that work again they're able to go and use that and we're talking about six and seven year olds so the more visual the better and so that's why you can see there's lots of diagrams there and again this is something that comes after the teaching so we will have taught the strategy the children will have done lessons on that they will have learnt with the teacher they might have worked in a small group with a teacher on these and then they're up in the classroom so that when they're doing their independent work they're able to actually um, use those strategies in practice. But one thing you probably can't see, which I'm extra excited about, is the use of the QR code again. But yeah. this time it's not linking to videos that I have made, but they are videos that other children have made. So when we have a child who feels that they are an expert at something, we've said to them, oh, okay, you know, do you think you could explain that to someone else? And so not only can the children go up and look at the example, but that might still be a little bit too abstract. And so they can watch a video of one of their peers clearly explaining to them um, how to use the strategy in practice. They're able to watch that and then have a, have a go at it themselves. I think that's amazing and I think I don't know whether on the powerpoints whether the people could actually pull up the QR codes they might be able to actually which would be terrific but it, you've just touched on something there too not only does that empower the learner for a for a learner to be able to explain something and teach someone else really does help make sure that they know that strategy themselves you know that which is such a good way of in feeling empowered that they're helping others, even if, if they're just making them. It's, such, it's a terrific use of technology and I was just, it's, it's awesome that the children are having these. Let's go on and look at this next slide that we've got here because again, it's, a, it's absolutely beautiful. We've got, got the four images across the bottom. We've got the square, the circle, uh, the, the diamond, and then we've got the, the, the red, which looks red and stop signs, what that's looking like to me. but can you talk our audience through what these are? Sure. So this slide is all about well-being because we know yeah. that you know, an education is not complete if we're only looking at the academic. So within you one, we're also really working hard on teaching skills um, around that area of well-being and social emotional learning. So down the bottom there, what you can see is a program that we run called the Zones of Regulation. And what it is, is it's just a fantastic tool to help the children to not only be aware of the emotions that they're feeling, but also to give them some strategies and to understand when it is that those emotions are, um, you know, appropriate. So, for example, well, we talk to the children about the fact that everybody feels a range of emotions yep. and that that is completely normal and that's completely okay. But there are times and places when those emotions are appropriate. And so, for example, in the green, we talk about the green being um, ready to learn. Yep. So that's when we're calm, we're focused, we're relaxed, we're happy. The blue is more on the lethargic side. So perhaps we're tired, perhaps we're a bit sad or lonely or something like that. And so the kids can communicate to us using those zones. So they, they might come up to us and say, I'm feeling in the blue zone right now, you know, that, that's why I'm finding it hard um, to do my learning. And so the fact that they're able to communicate that is fantastic. And then we have a range of strategies to help them to move them into the green zone. So, you know, if it's someone who's feeling tired, we might suggest, okay, you know, we're going to get up and we're going to do five star jumps and we're going to give ourselves a boost of energy or, you know, go and grab a bite of your munch and crunch and give yourself, you know, food there to get you going and then we'll get ourselves into the green zone. In the yellow zone, you might uh, recognise that that's, you know, kind of the warning the warning sign that you might see on a road sign and that's where we're starting to you know perhaps get a little frustrated perhaps get a little silly 
Um, and again, we talk to the kids about, you know, being in the yellow zone when you're outside in the yard is fine. You know, you want to be having fun. You want to be, you know, laughing and yeah. being excited with your friends. But again, maybe not such a perfect thing to be learning. And then in the red yeah. zone, you know, and you you said it exactly, it's the stop sign. And so, wow. you know, that, that's a sign, uh-oh, we're getting out of control now. And, you know, again, the kids might come to us and say, I'm in the red zone, I need your help right now. And so, you know, we're able to say, okay, you know, that's fine. And we'll be able to put some things in place for them. You know, do you need to sit down for a few minutes? Do you want me to do some mindfulness breathing with you? You know, and we give them a chance to calm down to, and then we'll talk about, well, you know, what what's happened, you know, what what's made you get there? I just love this when we were talking about this. This is such an excellent, you're making feelings really explicit. You're breaking them into different groups of feelings so children then start to know how to deal and think about feelings and that they're, okay, they're different and okay in different situations. I, I think I might borrow your red, your red zone for some, for some, some people I work with. <laughs> just into, I might say, I think you're in your red zone right now. Perhaps we should go outside and uh, we should move down. I, I think that's terrific. And again, it's something I've heard. We've done uh, different uh, webinars, and it's lovely to hear that this threads through our entire school all the way down. I actually just into the in the uh, ELV. They're doing self regulation, and that's regulation as well. So the children get this carried on through the school. The, the, the next um, image I, I am drawn to up there is you've got a chart. Um, you've got some sticky notes on it. There's three columns on that, and then we've got a temperature. It looks like temperature. And again, maybe I'm drawing wrong, but red to green. Can you tell us a bit more about this one? Sure. So this one um, is looking at the size of the problem matching the size of the reaction. So, wow. you know, if we've got parents on here of this age group, I'm sure that they're sitting there going, oh, yes, I know all about this one. <laughs> so here we talking to the children about, you know, big problems and small problems and, you know, what would be a small problem warrants a small reaction, a big problem warrants a big reaction. So what we might see in the classroom, you know, at the start of the year, for example, would be a child who, you know, their friend cuts in front of them in the line and, oh, my gosh, it's the end of the world and they get really upset and they might get in the yellow or the red zone and, you know, over that. And so we talk to them about, well, is that a small problem or is that a big problem because you're having a big reaction right now? And so we're just explicitly teaching them like we would in reading or maths about, you know, these things to do with regular and, and their social emotional well-being as well and so you know we teach them what is a small problem so a small problem is oh no I dropped my water you know my water bottle spilled yep. um you know someone cut in front of me in line you know things that might be frustrating a little bit frustrating that might make us a little bit sad for a few minutes but they're okay we could solve that problem ourselves we could go and get a um, piece of paper towel and wipe that up it's okay if someone moves in front. We just say, could you not do that next time, please? Small reaction. And then we teach them, well, there are some things, you know, which would warrant a bigger reaction. You know, so if you, um, I think in the medium there, it says, you know, you've broken your iPad. You know, you've dropped your iPad and it's broken. You know, you can't solve that one on your own. You might need help. Yeah. Or perhaps, you know, you and your friend have had, you know, an argument where you've both got really upset and said some things that you, you know, don't mean, okay, you know, that that might require a teacher to come in and help us with that. So, again, it's just a great visual because we're talking about young children and it's also just explicitly teaching them these skills because, you know, some of these I think we think are innate, but yes. they're not. We have to teach them to them. I, that's absolutely it. None of these are innate. They they should be taught. Um, otherwise, people don't know where they're coming to. This is, you know, this is this is so real for adults. This is absolutely. You know, I'm serious. It's like as adults, we give adults give things a ten when it's it's not a ten. It's only a, really a five, and that's about their own emotion and well being in life. And that's amazing that at those young ages, you're giving them the tools to really flourish in life emotionally. And that, and that is amazing, Jacinda. I, I cited when you were talking about this. Um, 
The next one I'm drawn to, and actually uh, you've got the learning pit there and you've got the little people with speech bubbles. Uh, that is what it is, isn't it? Little <laughs> speech bubbles going down. It the is. Learning pit. Can you talk us through this? Sure. So again, and this is related to that image we saw before about the, you know, where we were reflecting in math. So yes. we use that then as well. Um, this is a poster that I created with our students and it happens in all of our classrooms where we talk about the fact that sometimes learning is hard yes. and, you know, sometimes we're going to get into what we call the learning pit and that will be, you know, we're going to find things hard, we're going to find things frustrating and we talk about how, you know, at the start you might be really excited about learning something new and then, oh, hang on a minute, no, this is a bit hard and then, oh, no, I can't do this. And again, we talked to the students about, okay, well, we could sit in the bottom there and we could cross our arms and we could say, well, I'm not doing it anymore and I don't like this. Or we talk to them about, well, how do we get out of that? Because all of us are going to get there at some stage. And so we talk about and what you see in the, some of those are the thought bubbles. So what we might be thinking in our mind at different stages, but then the um, speech bubbles are, well, what could I do? Right. I can ask a teacher for help. You know, like I can I can say, I'm finding this hard. Can you help me? You know, or yeah. I can, and as it, as we're getting a little bit further up, we can give ourselves a bit of a pep talk and say, it's okay. You know, I can try it again. You know, that's okay. And so we've got pictures of the kids um, feeling those different emotions throughout that. And then, you know, you can see up the top there that once we get up the other side, you know, like we've found it hard, we've asked for some help, we've had some great help from our teacher or from our friends, how good that feeling is um, on the other end once you've finally got it and you're able to do it. And can I say that's probably my favourite part of being a teacher is seeing those moments with those students, those like light bulb moments where they go mm -hmm. off and they're just so proud of themselves and so we talk about how you know that's going to happen and it's okay there's so much of the learning that you make so explicit for them i think this is absolutely terrific i like that you are right the use of images to go back to that reminds them because a lot of these are different concepts yes and then the challenge of learning it will be challenging so again you are talking to people through that now, if you're doing that at year one at the school, that is building such good skill sets, then they expect that some learning is going to be like that. They know it's a normal. I, I think that's terrific. When we when we put this um, this webinar up on uh, in our Facebook, Jacinta, uh, one parent said her, 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 her statement was, "You are an outstanding teacher." <laughs> when I'm sitting there listening to this, I can't help but I know exactly uh, what she's talking about. So th it's really exciting. Um, let's go on to this this last image because I really I love this one. This is a really cool slide. You're talking about transitions, home support. There is never-ending parents wanting to know what they can do to aid the, aid their children. They want to be involved. And I think this is a really terrific approach that you've got here. I'll let you do some talk. <laughs> sure. So, look, as we said in the intro, I am a mum and my eldest mm. is in prep here. So there are some things on here that I use at home with my own child because I know what it's like. So, look, my number one advice to parents would be that we are, you know, you, when the kids get home, we've talked so much about what it is we're doing in the classroom and we're doing so much in the classroom. So don't be feeling like you need to be recreating the classroom again at home. Yeah. And I think through home-based learning, we've all learned that that's probably not a great idea. <laughs> So there are absolutely ways that you can support your child in their learning, but a lot of that is through play, it's through um, normal experiences that you're already doing, it's through building things like independence and curiosity and things like that. Obviously, if there are areas that your child needs to work on, your teacher will communicate that with you mm -hmm. and your teacher will provide you with, you know, specific things you need to work on with your child. But for the most part, you know, I'll talk you through some of the things I've got there. 
which are great ways which you can connect with your child and their learning without feeling the need to kind of sit down with them and you be the teacher and you know let's let's do some some equations today for maths or you know let's write a piece of writing so i think you know number one is just read 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 so i've got a picture there of um me with my son and my daughter when i don't know i think she was probably less than a month old at that point um, you know, the bedtime story. So just not only listening to your child read, but your child in year one will bring home a reader every day to practice and please do that with them. But also just read other books with them and, you know, enjoy literature and talk to them about great stories. Um, take them to the library and, you know, expose them to the wonder of nonfiction books and, you know, what what is it can you learn? I've got a photo there of, you know, one of the students outside looking at nature. You know, when you're outside, ask questions, get them to ask questions, you know, promote them to be curious and, you know, then go to the library and find a book on that or, or watch a video about that and together. I just think, you know, when you're cooking, you know, like that's a perfect opportunity to do some maths and, you know, read bus numbers together and talk about well which bus number is bigger you know that one or that one watch the footy with your kids and talk about the scores and who's winning and how much are they winning by these are just easy ways that you can be you know helping your child with the concepts that we're learning in the classroom but just in a really relevant and kind of carefree way i suppose i love that and you 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 did point out something really important there all day long the children engaged in lesson after lesson of learning and learning. So it is really important they do have some downtime too, isn't it? Because you, I, by the looks of it, your classes are pretty intense with learning. So that's <laughs> not short of that. It's a nice downtime. But you also talked about, which I thought nice, you've got five images up there. And I thought this is a terrific idea for all parents. Five little images, uniform, a shoe. <laughs> this must be for a boy. Is it, is it? <laughs> yeah. that that's that's what we have at our house um, oh, nice. to help help William get out the door in the mornings. So you've probably heard me say the word independent, independent coming through a lot tonight, and that's probably the step up from prep when we're looking at year one. So not to say that we are expecting them to do this right from the get go. There's a lot of support given. But within year one, we are looking for them to have a bit more independence and to be, you know, to show those self-management skills. So if you can be helping out with that at home by, you know, asking them to follow routines like, okay, so in the morning, this is what you need to do. And just like you've seen in the classroom where we have lots of visuals, use those visuals at home because, again, it stops you from having to say, what's next? Okay, now you need to brush your teeth. You've got your uniform on. Now you need to brush your teeth. Okay, after you brush your teeth, get your lunchbox. If you've got a visual up there for them, they can actually do that independently and they can just run through that routine themselves in the morning. So, and maybe have a different one for the afternoon so that they're um, in their bag as well. It just helps them form some responsibility for themselves and for their belongings as well. You know, um, children will come to school with their hat and we talk to them about, you know, that's your responsibility and make sure that you, you have it and that you're looking after it. And then inevitably it gets lost. So, and then parents are having to, you know, look for another one so if we can just be teaching them some of these skills at home it's going to um, reap benefits um, at school as well the little timetable that's down the bottom there is just another way again of teaching your child you know to be able to manage things themselves pack their own bag it shows them what uniform to wear because on PE days they have to wear their PE uniform. On non-PE days we just wear, wear our stripy uniform and gross motor um, we wear on a Friday. So, again, it shows them, okay, this is what you've got on for the day. This is what uniform you need to put on. Oh, look, I've got library today. I need to make sure my library bag is packed into my bag. And it just gives them, you know, that sense of responsibility and that ability to be a little bit more independent. Again, simple but absolutely wonderful. I think what you've saying there again, and just for our parents, is is again a lot of these things. Thoughts are abstract. So what what Justin is doing there by having up images there, it's so that they can it can help their thinking, 
and then each of those images will be in their mind and it's a lovely strategy to make them go to it, check each of those five off. It's going to make the parents' life a lot easier too with it, but you've made it explicit again. And beautiful, they learn to read a timetable. So they learn days of the week, they learn the order, they remember which days are in order, they know they've got some symbolism of what different symbols mean so that they mean that images can mean lots of things. Obviously, you did some teaching and talked them through it at the start, which of makes sense, but... I just know that children that feel that independence, they have an awesome feeling of autonomy, right? And they feel that they become so much more empowered to get on and do things. And that it can save some of those frustrations of trying to get out of a house, especially uh, I've got a, a boy too and I've got a bo bo son and a daughter and how they're quite different. Our boys perhaps need some of these wonderful little things um, set up. So it's, it's absolutely terrific. The other one you've got there, and you've got a little speech mark, and you've got the cross. How was your day or tick? And then you've got, tell me three great things. Talk to me about what you're thinking there. I know there's a bit more to it than just that. Sure. So one of the other things that you can um, help your child mm. with is just having a really positive view of school. Mm -hmm. You know, there are times when they've got come home, you know, and they've had that day when they've been in the bottom of the learning pit. And, you know, part of our role as parents and part of our role as adults is to help them gain that perspective and to help them, you know, understand that, okay, you know, today wasn't such a great day, but tomorrow is going to be a great one. And I know, you know, I hear parents all the time and I know myself as a parent that, um, you know, the first thing you do is you see them in the afternoon is, oh, how was your day? Good and that's all you get from them, you know, and you think, oh, my gosh, like you've been at school all day and that's all I get, good. Or you say to them, oh, have you had a good day? Yep. So first of all, can I recommend, you know, sure, ask them that question then, but maybe ask them it again later after they've had that bit of downtime, you, you know, maybe over dinner or maybe as you're sharing that bedtime story and you might you might have a little bit more success then. But Rather than asking how was your day, you know, frame it in a really positive way. Tell me three great things about your day or what was something that made you think today or tell me three things you did that were kind today or something that made you smile. Just asking it in a different way and you might get, you know, some different responses and it might just help you gain a little bit more information about what it is that your child is getting up to. You're making me feel guilty for asking that first question now. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, I do it. And then, and then I've also pulled up exactly like you said, oh, is that all you got to say? You know, good. Oh, that's great. But you're dead right. There's some beautiful <laughs> lessons there. I think that you should perhaps write down some of these. I'm sure parents are writing down some of these open-ended questions because it's an open-ended question is going to get a more in-depth answer. Three good things. You're setting them up for that, right? Um, what did you learn after morning tea? It makes them go back to a point in the day. Um, you know, what was maths about today? You know that. Like, talk about something like that. That could be, I like that. I really like that you said, and it's for all parents. I know we live busy lives, but if one advice I can give to parents is eat your dinner with your children. Sit down, have the meal with the children. It's one of the best things that's come all the way back from the 50s and 60s, all the way through is sit down and eat a meal with your children and talk about learning and the day. And it's such a powerful thing. It, it's, it, people want to help a lot with learning, but, they, but that one simple thing is actually one of the most in-depth ones. And I, I like that you framed up schools positive. Um, it's a wonderful, they turn up there with that attitude. I think that's terrific. Um, yeah, I think, sorry, oh, sorry Matt, I was just going to say that I think, you know, oral language is such an important part yeah. of, you know, precursor to reading and writing. And so, you know, if those conversations around the dinner table actually have a really powerful impact on mm -hmm. their language learning as well as, you know, helping us gain insight into their life and, you know, setting up those rituals and routines which, you know, provide a sense of safety and, and community within our families as well. You, you're absolutely right. I, I think that that's important. And again, everything that you've talked about here is you've made things explicit, you've set them up for success, you've made abstract thinking 
visually real, you've brought learning back. So I understand why that parent has said that about um, your teaching. It's wonderful to hear what year one looks like. Um, I will give the it, time does fly, Jacinta. So we're in our last 10 minutes. So let's give the audience, if there's any questions, we've had a couple, lovely one from Lisa and David. And, and David did say, by the way, he did say thank you uh, about the uh, working at the tables. He said, good to see them mixing it up. And and Lisa, uh, Lisa expla- uh, appreciated you talking about how how we help different learners, um, you know, different stages in maths and numeracy. So if any other parents has any questions that I'd like to dig into with you, please write them in there and I'll give them a little moment in that. Um, you know, it's when you talk about, I, I like the way that when you were talking about the, um, the writer's workshop, that there was the stages that the children could go back to. Um, that was the writing one. What was the reading one? Oh, I do have a question from Lawrence, but I'll come to that in a second. What does the reading workshop look like? I saw the writing one. What would the reader's one? I know it's jumping back a bit. I can go back in the slides. But, Carrick, can you talk us through that? Sure. So our reader's workshop um, has a similar uh, format. So what we would do is we would start with our mini lesson. So that's an opportunity for us to do some explicit teaching. And so, you know, it depends on what our focus is. We might have a focus on fluency and expression. So within that, we would be modelling and teaching the children about, you know, the skills to do with reading. It might be a skill to do with comprehension. And so we're using, you know, mentor text, quality literature to teach the children about that. So, and as a part of that, we're teaching them and we're modelling to them that I, as a reader, this is what I do as a good reader. Then within that um, opportunity, they oh, sorry, within that mini lesson, they also have a little chance to have a little practice together as a group. So it might be they work with their uh, reading buddy. So, for example, you know, if it's to do with fluency and expression. So today I taught, we were looking at punctuation and what we need to do when we're reading punctuation and how it changes our voices. And so I read a piece and then the kids were able to talk to each other about, well, what did you notice? What did Mrs. Matheson do when she got to a question mark? What did she do when she got to a comma? What was her voice doing? So they had that opportunity to have a chat themselves. During that time, I'm, you know, walking around and listening in to a few conversations. Then we will come back, we'll review what it is we've learnt. Then we go into the independent part. During that independent time, the children are doing lots of different things to do with reading. So it might be that I'm working one-on-one with a student and setting them a goal for their reading, what it is that they need to work on. I might be working with a small group of children and we're reading a book together and discussing it and working on something together. It might be that two children are reading together in a reading partnership and they're reading to each other and giving each other some feedback. Today the children were reading on their own but they're recording it on their iPads and listening back to themselves to hear what their how fluent they were and if they were listening to the um that paying attention to the punctuation so with that that's kind of our readers workshop structure and then at the end we come back together and we reflect and we get some of the children to share what they have done and then the next day it's a similar format but it will be different children doing different things so within that you'll notice there's you know children working independently children working with teachers mm-hmm. peer work happening um the children have some choice within that as well so it's just a really authentic way of teaching reading oh, I, I think that's fantastic while we've been talking we've got a couple of great questions from some parents here. One question, um, I'll start at the bottom. Rachel's asked, uh, do you do class plays or performances in year one? The reason she asked is her daughter loves singing and drama. And she did say excellent webinar, but she daughter loves oh. singing and drama. Can you? Yeah. Sure, thank you for that. Look, if you head outside at recess and lunchtime on any given day, you'll see plenty of performances and drama happening. But uh, I'm sure that you are looking for something that's perhaps a little more structured. So we do have, when we're able to, um, in regards to our safe um, management measures, we do have CPAs that run. Um, And some of those CCAs are around, you know, music and singing and drama. There's nothing particularly at the moment um, that is happening within that space. But 
that's because we're kind of um, yes. confined at the moment due to our COVID regulations. But we do have different CCAs that cater for, you know, lots of different interests. And there, I would um, really highly recommend that parents sign their children up for those because it gives them an opportunity to meet with other children who have a common interest and just to explore, you know, some, some different areas of learning and some different areas of life that perhaps they haven't had the opportunity to to do so. But I do know that a couple of years ago I ran a drama CCA in year one, so it is definitely the arts is, is definitely a part of, you know, what we're trying to encourage within our students as well. That's terrific. And like, like you said at the start, we do have specialist music teachers, so there's plenty of singing going on with specialist and they're specialist teachers, which is the, the amazing thing um, about them, which is really extraordinary. Um, I, I love the way that you, you, you sum that up. And the, just for them, um, CCA is just their cross-curricular activities, and these are run at lunch times, after schools. They are extra things onto a school. And I think you said the more children get involved in these, they go to different classes, not just their children from their class. It could be, um, you know, from... Uh, one one X or one W. I'm not quite sure the number you uh, leaders, but you know <laughs> another group anyway. Um, Lawrence has got a great question here. Um, he said, "Thank you, Lawrence. Great. Uh, may I ask how AIS helps new students settle in during the first week or two? And he said, "Is there a, a buddy system? Is there anything like that? Well, what do you guys do to help?" There absolutely is. Oh, nice. You know, I think. We are in an international school, so we are very used to families coming and going at all times throughout the year. You know, it's very different to perhaps a state school in Australia or where, or in any country where you would have a fairly stable population. We have people coming and going. And so I was actually talking to a family about this on the weekend. We've all been there. We all know what it's like be that new person who's just arrived you know we might have just arrived on the island we're dealing with you know how hot and humid it is and whatever else so the great thing about that is the kids are so welcoming to each other and we do buddy children um, who come in on their first day we used to give them a little red ribbon but now I think we've got a little pin that we give them um, to and that's just a visual for you know teachers and staff members but also to the children to say hey this is a this is someone who's new to our school so if they're looking a little lost or if they're looking you know like they need some help you know go up and speak to them and you'll mm -hmm. see the kids you know, clambering over each other. Can I be their buddy? You know, I'll show I'll show them where the toilets are and I'll show them the best place to play outside. Um, and so we do, we buddy them up in the classroom. We help them um, get used to our school environment because it can be quite big and, you know, we provide support within that. That sounds absolutely terrific. And it's a children's nature. They're like you just said, they, they clamber to be the person to help. You're not short of that. Um, I know that parents worry about that, uh, like they say about moving. It's been a big upheaval, but I, we are the experts at it. And like you said, expat population. Every year we come and we go and we make new friends and we have you know, friends leaving and all those sort of things, and we deal with that, which is terrific. We've actually, just to believe it or not, this is an hour, so we're at 6 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I, I could listen to you all day long. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure. So uh, there's no more questions at the moment. I just want to say thank you very much for your time um, preparing for this and coming along. Uh, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It is recorded. Uh, we also have the presentation that we can send out to you. So thank you very much to everyone. Go and enjoy your evenings. And uh, we'll perhaps see you again for another webinar at another time. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.